Okay, good evening class. Today we're going to have a teach back on the uh, skeletal system for anatomy. Um, we all know for a fact that when we eventually uh, see patients, uh, we will be able to see a lot of conditions that affect the bones, right? Yes. Uh, does anybody know what is the term used to describe when you have a break in the bone? Fracture. 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 Right. So how many of you had experienced a fracture in your life? Okay, around maybe less than 10 of you, 8 to 10. Uh, what bones were involved here? Can anybody tell me? Yes? Both the radius and the ulna. OMG, both radius and ulna. Okay, fracture. what happened to you, Phil? Uh, yeah, I kind of, um, I was young and I tried to break my fall coming off the monkey bars. Oh, wow. Okay. You were young? How, how young were you then? I was uh, seven. Seven years young, okay. Yes, what, what bone did you break? Uh, tibia and tibia, both. Which ones? Uh, both of the, my shin, tibia and tibia, both of them. Tibia and fibula, okay. And it was okay. the, uh, the, the break that goes like that. The, yeah, the so yeah, the displays. Yeah, the So apparently, a lot of you have experienced a fracture of the bone, so today that will be our topic on the bone, right? Okay, can anybody tell me, class, when you think of bones, like this one here, does anybody know what this bone is? Femur. Femur. Where do you find this bone? The arm or the thigh? thigh. It's a thigh bone, right? So if I tell you, class, we have a fracture of the femur, are you going to look at the arm or the thigh? thigh. You see what I, how important is anatomy in both nursing and medicine, right? We want everyone to be as smart as they can be. Can you imagine I tell the nurse the fracture is in the th uh, femur and you're looking at the arm? <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's so funny, huh? Okay. Mm what about this bone here? What is this bone? It's in the leg. What bone is this? The one here she broke? Tibia. Tibia. And what is the bone beside the tibia? The smaller bone? The fibula. The fibula. Very good, right? And obviously, what is this bone here? It's the bone, right? It's of the foot. You have so many bones here, right? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna go over these bones of the foot, right? Mm -hmm. Here, what is the bone in the upper arm? Humerus. Humerus, so you are humerus today, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just joking, it's H-U-M-E-R-U-S, right? What about in the forearm, what are the two bones there? Radius, Radius and ulna, very good, right? So when we talk of bones, what kind of tissue is bone? Is it epithelial, is it muscular, nervous, or connective? connective. Is it connective or connective? connective? And you're absolutely right, okay? So we know for all also that the bone is important. Can anybody give me a reason why bones are important to us? What is in the bone that is important? Blood cells. What does the bone produce? Blood cells. Blood cells, like your red blood cell, your white blood cell, and your platelet, right? Now where are these cells produced? Now the platelet, by the way, is not even a cell. Only the red blood cell and white blood cell. The platelet is a fragment of a cell, right? And you will learn that when we talk about the, the blood vessel, uh, blood cells, okay? Now where is these blood produced? Red, oh, red bone marrow. And where is the red bone marrow found? In the bone. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how simple anatomy could be, right? Where do you find the red bone marrow? In the bone. What about the yellow bone marrow? Also in the bone. How do I know that it's in the bone? If I were to cut the femur like this, in the middle sharp portion of the bone, there is a cavity there, right? That medullary cavity is occupied by, what do you think is the yellow bone marrow that is found in the medullary cavity made of? Fat. What is the color of fat class? Yellow. Yellow fat inside the medullary cavity and of course, it's mostly made up of what? Fat, Fat or adipose tissues, right? Okay. Now, now, because this bone tissue is made of cells, let's review the types of cells that you find in your bone, right? Okay. If I were to, again, in the process of learning, we want our students to be very highly organized in the way they learn things. And one way of doing that is creating what we call a concept map, right? What is a map? What is a map for? To give direction so that you will reach your what? Destination. And what is your destination? To learn. To learn as much as you can on a particular topic. Our topic today is on bones and the skeletal system, correct? Okay, now, question is, if I say bone and say cells, a concept map, as, as the term imply map, to give you direction so that you will learn, is a way upon which we can organize ideas, information, so that you get rid of things that you don't need, right? So if I just say bone cells, you will just put here are what? What kind of words? Pertinent, relevant words. 
right? So, what do you call that bone cell that is technically a stem cell? Oh, I like this class. We're very smart, okay? Osteo progenitor cell. Now, this osteoprogenitor cell, which are basically the stem cells, will give rise to what? What will it be become? Osteoblast. OMG, osteoblast. So is that another type of cell? Yes. Okay. What does the osteoblast produce? Bone matrix. Very good, bone matrix. Now, this is nothing to do with the movie matrix. Remember matrix, the movie? Okay, it's not. And then, osteoblast is what? The immature bone cell, and the moment it matures, what is the term used to yes. call it? Osteocyte. Osteocyte. Another type of cell. Cyte means cell, osteo means bone. But what is specifically the feature of this bone? It makes Mature bone cell. As we said, the osteoblast produces the bone matrix, mm -hmm. right? But what does the osteocyte do? Monitor. Maintain and monitor what? The bone matrix. Bone Very good. Now, there is a different type of cell that is important for what we call osteolysis or breakdown of bones. Lysis means breakdown, osteo means bone. And what is that cell? OMG. Osteoclast. Bone breakdown, okay, which means osteolysis. Osteolysis means bone breakdown. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. Now, do we need calcium in the formation of bone? Yes. Of course. There's a reason why do we encourage you to drink milk when you're growing? Yeah. Because can milk help strengthen your bone? Yeah. Definitely, right? So milk is important because it contains calcium, now remember the word osteoporosis? Yes. What happens in osteoporosis? The bones become very brittle, why? The, the, in other words, in osteoporosis, what does pore mean? The bone is here, it has a lot of what? Space. Pore means what? Holes. And when there are small holes there, it can easily what? Break. break. It's called a pathologic fracture or break in the bone. Is this common in what? Young women or elderly women? Elderly. Elderly women. Okay. Can it also affect men? Yes. Yes. But mostly women more than men. So when I reach the age of 70, can I develop osteoporosis too? Yes. How do you prevent the development of osteoporosis by what? Walking on the by exercising, walking, running, but of course at my age, I probably prefer to walk. <laughs> Weight-bearing exercise, okay? Anything that will provide some pressure to the bones will make it easier to prevent it from developing osteoporosis. That's the reason why in elderly nursing homes, we tell the elderly patients to what? Exercise, to walk. Do we encourage them to dance? Of course, we should encourage them to dance, you know? Cha-cha, tango, you know? No, but not the two fast ones, you know, they might fall if they, <laughs> without another fracture. Okay, so, do we need calcium? Yes. Right? Okay. Now, uh, there are bone hormones that affects bone growth. One of them would be what? Is growth hormone going to affect your bone growth? Yes. yes. Of course. So that's why people who have excessive growth hormone become giants, right? Seven feet or eight feet in height. Okay, if you lack the growth hormones, you become a dwarf. Growth hormones are important. What other hormone is important for bone sex development and growth? The thyroid hormone, right? From the thyroid gland in the neck. As we know, as we remember, the growth hormone is produced why? by what? The anterior lobe of the pituitary gland in the brain. And this pituitary gland is found where? Cellia torsica of the sphenoid bone, remember? In the lab, okay? So, growth hormones, thyroid hormones, that's why if you lack thyroid hormones, will you also suffer from dwarfism? You, you can have dwarfism in patients with lack of thyroid hormones, right? Okay? Now, what about calcitonin? What does calcitonin do? It comes from the thyroid gland, just like the thyroid hormones. Now, the calcitonin, I will just summarize the effect of this hormone. 
is to lower the blood calcium. Why? Because the calcium in the blood goes where? To the bone. In other words, calcitonin from the thyroid gland is a hormone that will allow the calcium where? In the blood to deposit where? To the bone. To the bone. Will that make the bone stronger? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, because as we have emphasized here, do we need calcium to produce bone strength or tensile strength in the bone? Yes? Does it make sense? Okay. We need calcium. How can you make the bone stronger? By the deposition of calcium in the bone. Now, can anybody tell me what is the technical scientific term when you say deposition of calcium to bone? Very simple. K-I-S-S, yes? Huh? Calcium deposition. Oh my goodness! <laughs> You're the woman! Why do you have to make it simple or complicated? It's only used where in Facebook. Remember Facebook? Complicated relationships. In our class, what we want is simplicity. What is K-I-S-S? Keep it simple, smart student of West Coast. I do the same thing at UCLA. My first year medical I also tell them K-I-S-S. Keep it simple, smart student. What is the deposition of calcium in your bones? Calcification. And what hormone promotes calcification? The calcitonin, right? So by allowing the calcium to go from the blood to the bone, what happens to the blood calcium levels? It lowers it. Now what is the hormone that has an opposite effect? What's the name of that hormone? If it's not thyroid hormone that is calcitonin, it's called parathyroid hormone. Now, it's not fair to you guys because obviously we have not discussed the endocrine glands, but probably if you have read the book, it's mentioning, it has probably mentioned about hormones that affects the bone development, right? Mm -hmm. So calcitonin, on the other hand, will increase the calcium levels in the blood, why? The parathyroid hormone will, no, the parathyroid, sorry, the parathyroid hormone will allow the calcium, what? To go from the bone to the, to the blood. Do you understand? Okay? Now, when we're dealing with bone, right? We talked about all these uh, bone cells, the importance of these bone cells, and we talked about the parts of the bone, right? What do you call this proper part of the bones in a long bone like this? Proximal epiphysis, and what do you call the other part? Distal epiphysis. What about the shaft of the bone? OMG, diaphysis, very smart. So what about the boundary between the diaphysis and the epiphysis? The metaphysis, very good. With regards to the layers of the bone, what do you call the outer layer of the bone? Periosteum, what does peri mean? Around osteo means bone. What do you call the part of the bone? in the inner aspect. If I were to cut the bone in the middle shaft portion like this, this is the bone, there is a cavity here. What is the name of that cavity here? And what is the wall here? What's the lining here called? Endostrum. So the endostrum lines the medullary cavity while the periosteum is found outside. Now the periosteum is important for the simple reason that it is where most of these blood vessels are attached. This blood, are blood vessels found in your bone? Does the bone need arteries and veins? Yes. Remember arteries carry oxygenated blood? And what about veins? The oxygenated blood, because bone is made of tissues and tissues are made of cells. These cells need what? Blood, particularly oxygen. And of course, all the other nutrients that you need, right? Particularly oxygen plus glucose, right? Do you understand class? Yes. Okay, now, there are two types of bone tissue. It could be what, either? Compact, compact, compact or what? Spongy. Compact or? Spongy. Okay. The hip bone that makes up the hip joint is what? The femur, mm -hmm. right? And what else? And the socket here, right? Made up of the pelvic bone, right? Does anybody know the name of the socket here? Acetabulum. What is this called? Head of the femur. Because it is spherical, it looks like the head, right? This is the left femur. Now the question is, this area of the bone is made of spongy bone? 
Four compact bonds. Spongy bonds. What about the shaft? So which do you think would easily break? Because don't remember the word sponge. What does sponge mean? Soft. Easily breaks. Could that explain the reason why when you reach the age of 60 or 70 and when you have osteoporosis and you are working in the garden, you're a 70 year old female and you suddenly fall, when you, hip, when you have a hip fracture, can that break the bone in the area called the neck of the femur, right? What is it called? Head. What is it called? Neck. What is it called? Neck. What is it called? Neck. Cold? Neck. Cold? Neck. Cold? Neck. Cold? Neck. Cold? Neck. Oh my God, don't you love anatomy? <laughs> Amazingly simple. Head, neck, head, neck. <laughs> Greater what? Trochanter. What is this called? Lesser trochanter. It's very important for me. Yes, I don't like nurses to misspell words, especially when you look at the chart. True canter. <laughs> T-R-O-C-H-A-N-T-E-R. Trochanter. Greater, the bigger one, and? Now, you might be wondering, Dr. Gamma, do we really need to know all these details? I'll tell you why. You can have a fracture of the neck. It's called femoral neck fracture. Very easy. But if the doctor tells your nurse, today we're going to have a patient with a fracture called intertrochanteric fracture. What does that mean? The fracture is found between the greater and then what? See the big difference? If you break the neck of the femur, what happens with the blood supply to the head? There is none. This will die. It's called necrosis. And there's a reason why, what do we recommend for these women with the head of the femur that, who, who, now, now dead? There you go. How many of you have relatives with hip replacement? Bilateral or only one? Is it total hip replacement or partial? Total means you replace both the head of the femur with titanium, right? It's a metal implant. And you also replace one the acetabulum with man-made socket. Do you understand? Now me, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe in the future, I might develop what? Severe osteoarthritis and also osteoporosis. I might break my neck of my femur. I might end up with a hip replacement, right? Do you know that we can now also do a knee replacement? Yeah. A shoulder replacement, name it, we have it. I look forward to the day I just go to Walmart and can I buy that shoulder? <laughs> No, I'm just joking. It's not a problem because we have to bring it in, right? Do you understand, class? Okay? So, when it comes to bones, we have talked about the parts of the bone, uh, the membranes of the bone. We talked about the importance of bone and their function. Bone can be classified either axial or what? Appendicular. Appendicular. Right? Axial or what? So, when we say axial, we're referring to what? You're referring to? Anything that's in the main axis. Does that include the skull? Yes. Yes. Everything that's found in the skull, does it include the spinal column? Yes. yes. Does it include the rib cage? Yes. yes. Does that include your sternum? sternum? Yes. Yes, it does. What about the three bones in the ear called auditory what? Ossicles. Auditory means hearing. Ossicle means the three bones are, remember the three bones there? Mm -hmm. Give me the three bones, please. Yes? Now uh, is Perfect. Which one looks like a hammer? Mallet? Yeah. Malleus. Anvil? Even the anvil, the blacksmith puts, uh, you know, incus. And the stirrup? Stapes. It's the stapes. Now, why are these bones important in the middle here? They vibrate. They, they what? They vibrate. They do vibrate. Can you imagine we have a vibrator there? Inside? <laughs> no, I know what you're thinking. You're very green, okay? It's like the color of the wall over there. When I say vibrator, because it does vibrate. For example, if I sing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. The sound, the sound waves enters the ear canal, causes the eardrum or tympanic membrane to vibrate, causes the malleus to vibrate, incus to vibrate, staves to vibrate, oval window and transmission of nerve impulses in the inner ear. Isn't that amazing? This is very small bones. So these are the smallest bones in your body. They're called auditory what? 
Because when you hear the word auditory, it pertains to what? Yeah. Sense of sight or hearing? hearing? There you go. Okay? So, what about appendicular skeleton? You're referring to what? The bones made up of what we call shoulder or pectoral girdle made up of what? Clavicle, scapula, and the upper limb bones which includes what? Humerus, radius, and ulna, the eight carpal bones, the five metacarpal bones, and the phalanges. How many phalanges do we have? Fourteen. Each second, third, fourth, fifth has three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, four, three. Proximal, middle, distal. Problem in the thumb, we only have what? One, two. Do you understand? Okay. Now, what about the lower limb? It's attached to what you call this bone here? Pelvis, right? Os coxa made up of three bones, remember? What do you call this big bone here? Ilium. There, you're sitting on your what? I-S-C-I-U-M, ischium. Ilium, the biggest bone, and what is the bone in front? That's why when you have hair in that area, what's the name of the bone? The hair. Oh my God! <laughs> Makes sense, right? What's the name of the bone here? What's the name of the hair there? I love anatomy. It's so simple. What is the, what is the name of the hair in front of the pubic bone? Is there a bone, that, there's a hair at the back, there's none. So there is, is there any ischial hair? No. Only pubic hair. Uh, just laughing, okay? Okay. So, we now know that, we know the difference between, so we have the pelvic girdle for the lower limbs, which includes what? The, the femur, right? What else? Tibia and fibula. Tarsal bones and the metatarsal bones, including the phalanges, right? So the fingers have the same name as that of the toes. They're also known as phalanges. What about the number of phalanges? The same. Okay, 14 in the fingers. And then how many in the foot? 14. We also have 14. Second, third, fourth, fifth toe. One, two, three, one, two, three. Proximal, middle, distal. Proximal, middle, distal. Times 12. Four times three is 12. 13, 14. It's like the thumb. One, two. The rest, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. So the idea, therefore, is this. Our goal is for you to know the names of the bones and more or less get to know the big ones. I, I, if it's possible to know all the bones, why not? Because our goal is academic excellence. We want you to be the smartest person in the universe, not just the world. If the time will come, times which you have to put up a hospital in the moon, you'll be what? Smarter than a Martian or a... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking, okay? Now, let's start with the actual skeleton. We talked about the skull, right? The skull is made up of two parts. What do you call here? Facial bones. Oh my God, oh my goodness. Facial bones because they're in the face, right? Yeah. What about here? Cranium. Cranium. Okay. So, what is the bone in front? The frontal bone. <laughs> Don't you love it? What's the name of the bone in front? Bone. What about the bone in the back? Is it backbone? Occipital. There you go. It's called the occipital bone, right? So at the back, we have the occipital bone. In front? Frontal. On top? Frontal. Here in the temple? Frontal. There you go. Now, these bones are separated by what we call sutures, right? What do you call the suture that passes to the corona brain? OMG again. <laughs> what about the sagittal. sagittal plane? Sagittal suture. What about the suture here between the parietal and the occipital bone? There you go. Between <coughs> temporal and parietal. There you go. Squamous suture. Right? Okay. Now, this is the bone itself. By the way, this is a real bone, a real skull. Okay? Now, let's try to know if you remove what we call the calvarium here, what is this bone called, like a similar to the wing of a butterfly or bat? So you have a greater wing and a lesser wing, right? So as I have mentioned a while ago, there is a structure here called the cellula torsica of the sphenoid bone and what gland is found there? There you go. Now, I believe in, in clinical anatomy, which means that Whatever doctors do in the hospital, like when they perform surgery, 
There has to be an anatomical basis for what they do. What is critical thinking, class? Critical thinking is nothing else but common sense thinking. Do, what, do I want my nurses to have criti become critical thinkers? Yes. yes. Common sense? <coughs> okay. So let's say, again, let me review. What is found in the cellular turcica of a sphenoid bone? Now remember these giants I mentioned, they're eight feet in height. Mm -hmm. There is a tumor in the pituitary gland that allows it to have over secretion of growth hormones. Mm -hmm. So instead of just five, 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 or five, nine, or six feet, they are eight feet, nine feet in height. It's called gigantism. Hypersecretion, hypersecretion secretion of the growth hormone because of a tumor in the pituitary gland. Unless we remove the pituitary gland, this patient will, what could happen? They'll die. They will rest in six feet under the, and becomes a permanent resident of forest cemetery. We don't want that to happen, right? So the neurosurgeon will perform a procedure called hypophysectomy. You don't have to know the spelling right now. Ectomy means removal, surgical removal. Hypophysis, H-Y-P-O-P-H-Y-S-I-S, is another name for pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. So the, per, the surgeon or the neurosurgeon will remove the pituitary gold, gland called hypophysectomy. Where do you think is the best approach? Oh. On top or through the nose? Oh, the nose. Oh, and you could all become potential neurosurgeons because you have common sense. <laughs> Why through the nose or transnasal approach? It's right there. Right there. Not only that, if you do it here, you destroy all the brain tissue here. And you end up with a patient who will be a vegetable. Does it make sense to you guys? Yes. So the doctors and your surgeons are smart people too. <laughs> they use their anatomical background to know that it has to be through a transnasal approach to be able to remove that one. The tumor here in the pituitary gland is in the cellular turcica. Do you understand what? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. The same thing with you. When you become future nurses, we want you to be smart. Be able to apply what you have learned in this class until when? Until you die. Why? 150 years and from now, do things change? Yeah. So by then I would be 157 years old. <gasps> what is the name of the bone in the nose? Oh, nasal bone, because what does nasal mean? Nose. Oh my gosh, I love anatomy, right? How many of you love anatomy here? Okay, if you did raise your hand, you can... Getting there. <laughs> you should love everything you do in nursing, right? You want to be the best nurse? What do you call the, the bone here? Yeah. What about the bone here? Yeah. The bone here? Yeah. Cheekbone. Yeah. Oh, you're so smart. Yeah. Where is the upper teeth attached to? Yeah. Maxilla. What about the lower teeth? Yeah. If I open my mouth, I put my finger inside, what is that called? Hard palate or hard palate? Hard Why is it hard palate? It's made up of bone. Now there are two bones that make up the hard palate. What are these two bones, class? Okay, very good. Maxilla and what? So let me get another bone here. As you can see, maxilla here, maxilla there. M-A-X-I-L-L-A. What do you call the small bone at the back? Palatine bone, that's why it's called hard palate. But the bigger portion of that is actually the maxilla. Do you understand? Yes. Okay? So let's review. Bone, tell me. Bone. Bone. The bone at the base of the nasal septum. Very good. Okay? Now, when it comes to the skull, right? What you call this areas of the skull that are found in the maxilla, the frontal bone, that contain air cells or the pneumatized. Sinus. Okay, a sinus, right? Yeah. A sinus is important, okay? You see, the sinuses have what? Small holes. Uh -huh. It's an empty space. Air. What's inside there? Air. It's an air space. It's a bony air space. So what is found inside this air space? Air. Oh my gosh! You're absolutely right. And what is the purpose of air inside that bony air space? To make it lighter. Right? To make it lighter so that every time I walk, I won't be. <laughs> Not only that, 
Why do you want A there? Now, have you heard of the... Now, let's, let's, let's go back to that. It's a space here, but the space, if this is the space here, it's lined with what? Mucous membrane. Mucous membrane. membrane. And what is a mucous membrane? They create? Mucus. 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 And where does this old mucus go? To the nose, because they're called paranasal sinuses. Frontal sinus in the frontal bone. Ethmoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus. And which one is the largest of them all? Are these all sinuses? Yes. Are they bony air spaces? Yes. Do they contain air? Yes. Is this air space lined with mucous membrane? Yes. And does the mucous membrane secrete mucus? Yes. And where does the mucus go? Yes. That's why they're called paranasal sinus because they go where? Yes. What is the purpose of the mucus in the nose? To yes, my dear? Yes, you. Um, to... To... Humidify. Yeah, this were a beauty yeah. contest. <laughs> To humidify the air that you're breathing. Very good. What else? And to, put, uh, to, to trap any dust. Trap any foreign body or exactly. foreign particle like dust. Because you don't want the dust particle to enter the lung. It want, you want it to get it trapped there. Humidify. How can it be able to humidify the air because of the presence of what is found in the mucus? Mucus is a combination of water, water mostly. So when you humidify, have you heard the word humidifier, right? <laughs> you buy it at Walgreens, drug stores. What is the purpose of that? To liquefy or humidify the air. Do you want dry air to enter your lung? No. no. The reason why you go to the hospital, you see these oxygen sources on the wall. Is there any air that's bubble with water? Yes. Precisely. We just copied human nature, the unnatural body. We got the inspiration from there. Does it make sense? Humidifier. So humidify, drop the dust. Now. That dust together with the mucus is going to dry up. What do you call that? Booger. And what is booger rectomy? <laughs> Joke only. According to Dr. Gamo, and that's me, I have come up with a dictionary called booger rectomy. It's a new word. Booger rectomy is defined as the surgical removal, just like appendectomy, surgical removal of the appendix, tonsillectomy, removal of the tonsils. But in booger rectomy, is defined as the surgical removal of the booger with a scalpel called the there you go. Inserted in an upward rotatory motion. <laughs> I'm just joking. Every time I drive from the Anaheim to here, it takes me one to two hours depending on the traffic. So I do a multitasking. I drive with my one hand with the steering wheel and then the hand with performing book direct to me. <laughs> so when I come to class, don't you ever shake my hand? But it will be a privilege and honor to share my boogers with you. I'm just joking. Yeah, okay. I'm just joking. Okay, now, what happens when you have sinusitis, inflammation of the sinuses? Will there be excessive accumulation and production of mucus? Yes. So, will you be able to put the mucus there? Yes, but not all, because there's excessive production. Some of the mucus will remain where? In the sinuses. What happens to the pressure inside these sinuses? Up or up? Of course, they go up. Can that be the reason why you have a sinus headache? Yes. What is the, the accumulation of mucus in the sinus? It's called sinus congestion. C-O-N-G-E-S-T-I-O-N. Sinus congestion is when a patient has sinusitis, there is excessive accumulation of mucus in the sinuses, causing them to develop a headache. What do you think Dr. Gamma will prescribe these patients? And he saw what? Oh my God, decongestant. Does it make sense to you guys? Yes. From the word sinus, what? Congest. Congestion. What will do with what will be prescribed? Nasal what? They congest. In other words, it will stop the excessive production of mucus. And therefore, it's like a, a leaking faucet with the water leaking, and then give the medicine, wow, within one second, five seconds, one minute, bam, gone. It's dry. Does it make sense? Right? Mm -hmm. The most effective, I would say, is a drug. Can you, can, you, can you share me what are the ones that you use in the market? Yes? Pseudoephedrine. Huh? Pseudoephedrine. So, pseudoephedrine, which is what? Pseudoephedrine, right? Mm -hmm. The trade name is pseudoephedrine. It's, it's pseudoephedrine. It's a, a, a generic name, right? Mm -hmm. Very effective. When I came here in 2002 from the Philippines, I migrated in 2002. Every time we have a running nose. Why is it called running? Because the nose is running. You know, instead of walking. <laughs> I go to Walgreens, I see the word Sudafed, bam, buy it, no problem. For the past years, I need a prescription. Why? What did people do with the pseudoephedrine? Convert that into what? 
Methamphetamine, good or bad? Bad. bad. It's, a illegal, it's a drug, right? How many of you used it? I'm just joking. <laughs> Wanna catch you? <laughs> methamphetamine, have you ever seen these pictures on Facebook with men and women with methamphetamine, drug addiction? No more teeth. Please don't, be careful ladies and gentlemen. Don't you ever try taking drugs when you are young, young men and women like you. Never do that. Okay, now let's move on. So, in terms of the spine, we know the spine has seven cervical vertebrae, C1 to C7, 12 thoracic, T1 to T12, five lumbar, L1 to L5, five sacral, but what happened to the sacrum? It got fused. So S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. What about the coccyx, the tailbone? Three. Two to four, three. And it also got fused, right? So we have a tailbone. You and I have a tail. Do we wiggle our tail? Yes. Okay, I'm just joking. Of course not, right? Now, we know also for a fact that these have curves, right? If you look closely at my booty, cervical and lumbar what? Lordosis, like Lord of the Rings. L-O-R-D-O-S-I-S. -S. Cervical, lumbar lordosis. What about thoracic and sacral what? Kyphosis. See the curves here? See? Now, these curves, as we know, let's get the uh, eraser, okay? Primary and secondary, or what we call acquired. Of the spine. Spinal what? Curvatures, right? The primary are formed while you were still inside the mother's womb. Do you, do you remember those times? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do remember. When I was nine months old, I was there. The best time of my life because what did I say in class? I have a free swimming pool, the amniotic fluid, all the backstrokes in the freestyle. And I was doing this, what, fetal position. So when I do the fetal position, I will form my thoracic and sacral what? Physiologic. Kyphosis. When I say physiologic, it means normal. It's expected to have a kyphotic curve. Like this. Like the hunchback, right? But it's normal. Because it was formed while I was in my mother's womb. I was assuming the fetal position. What about acquired or secondary curves? Lumbar. And then what? I'm sorry, cervical. And lumbar what? Lumbar lordosis. Now the question is, when do we develop our cervical lordosis? When the baby begins to what? Walk or lift the hand, of course. So remember, when I was a baby, let's pretend I'm lying down in the bed. And then I rolled over, and then I, what did I do with my head? I was looking for mama. What does mama have that papa doesn't have? Milk. Mama, mama, I need your milk, mama. Every time we do that, what happens to the head? The muscles of the neck. Are they going to be strengthened? Yes. Can you imagine the mother? The, mo the baby looks for the mother because she's hungry. Wah, wah, mommy, mommy, wah, wah. She's actually doing what? She's going to a gym like every day in that crib. <laughs> she doesn't know it, but it's actually a what? A converted gym. It's free. On the other hand, what happens when the baby, when does the baby develop the lumbar lordosis? When the baby begins to what? Walk or stand? Before you can walk, you have to learn how to what? Before you can stand, you have to learn how to sit. <laughs> Don't tell me you jump from crawling to standing. Right? So crawl, and then you crawl, and then you went to the end of the crib, and then you begin to what? Yeah. Look, Ma, I'm standing. I have developed my lumbar lordosis. <laughs> you see? Lumbar lordosis. Can you imagine a smart, a smart kid like that? Why is this kid so smart? Because we had given them lectures in anatomy while they were still in the mother's womb. I showed them my video. Oh, you're pregnant, okay? I own YouTube, right? How many of you have subscribed to my channel? Okay, for those of you who did that, don't show your face, okay? <laughs> I'm just joking. I, all the videos are there, and even pathophysiology, okay? 
So the bottom line is that cervical lordosis, keyword, left head. Lumbar lordosis, stand. Does it make sense? It's so crazy when you see these kids when they start to hold the crib and then they stand. They're so proud. As if they're telling you, look, ma, I'm smart. I'm able to stand now. Next step is what? Walk. And then walk away from this house when I reach the age of 18. <laughs> okay? Do you understand the class? Now, so we talked about the spine, right? Now, the spine is important for another reason is that it protects what? The spinal cord, right? You see this yellow thing inside? What is that called? Spinal cord, right? The spinal cord is this continuation of the brain. It passes to the foramen magnum at the base of the occipital bone. And it ends at the level of L1 and L2. Remember? L5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It ends here. Now, what do you call these nerves that will arise from the spinal cord? Spinal nerves. Of course! Don't you love anatomy? What do you call the nerve that comes from the spinal cord? This one? So what happens if you have a slip disc like this one here, see? When this disc in between the vertebral bodies will slip or herniate, H-E-R-N-I-A-T-E, -E, what will the herniated or slip disc do to the spinal nerve? Pinch or compress it or compress it? Compress it. It will compress it. Will there be a lot of pain and numbness and muscle weakness? Yes. From here to all the way to the back of the thigh and the leg yes. and the foot with numbness associated as if there's an electrical pain sensation? You may have to do surgery on you, okay? Do you understand class, okay? So the idea, therefore, is that the spinal column is designed to protect the spinal cord because the spinal cord is soft, the spinal column is made of bone, which is hard, right? But still, even though it's hard, if you ride a horse, can you break your neck? Yes. Just like Robert happened to Christopher Reeve, right? Remember him? Yeah. Superman, he broke his neck, he fell, he became quadriplegic. What does quad mean? Four, Four limbs are paralyzed. Plegic means complete paralysis. What about if you have a stab wound or gunshot wound damaging your thoracic spinal cord? You end up with what? Paraplegia. P-R-A-P-L-E-G-I-A. -A. Okay? How can you break your neck? Very simple. How many of you go to a swimming pool that says no diving? And what do most men do? They, still, they don't use their head. You know, they're not thinking. You dive in a pool that is three feet in height, what happens? You can break your neck, you end up with a cervical spine fracture. Can you become paralyzed from the neck down? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay, do you understand, class? Okay, be very careful. I don't want you to be quadriplegic. Very hard, okay? Paraplegic, well, you could have been in a wheelchair, but still, it's hard, right? Okay? Now, let's move on to the, uh, so let, let's talk about the uh, other bones here. What is the bone here? Sternum. What do you call the upper part of the sternum? Manubrium. Body and then the lowest part. When we do chest compression, remember, patient goes into cardiac arrest. The palm on the heel of one hand, other hand intertwined on top like this. Where are you going to put your fingers here? The patient is on the, the bed. What do you do? The body of the sternum or the cyphoid process? Why the body? Okay, again, I want you to think carefully before you answer the question. Why do we put our hand on the body of the sternum? It's where the heart is. It's the hardest? Is there any other reason? Heart. Of course, what is found underneath? The heart. <laughs> oh my gosh! Is that what you call common sense thinking? Yes. Everybody do a, make a fist. This is the same size as your fist. Is the heart that your heart you have? If you put your heart here behind the body of the sternum, that's where you compress because when you go into cardiac arrest, what does cardiac arrest mean? The heart has stopped pumping blood. You have to what? Compress the heart. Is the heart here in the cyphoid process? No. Is it behind the body of the sternum or underneath the body of the sternum? Yes. Do you understand why anatomy is so important? Yes. We want our nurses to be smart, critical thinkers. And you understand why? Both doctors that I teach, the medical students I teach at UCLA and the students I have here, we want them to be very smart because they're dealing with here with human lives. So can you imagine you were doing it on the cyphoid process? <laughs> what could happen to the cyphoid process? <laughs> it could break, you end up with a fracture. Can it puncture your liver and your spleen? Yes. Can it puncture your lung? Yes. And what goes to death? The punctured lung. 
It's not even the heart arrest, cardiac arrest, it's the punctured lung. Who caused the death? Yes. It's called NID, nurse induced death. No, I'm just joking, there is no such thing. There's also DID, what is DID? Do doctor induced death. When doctors and nurses are not careful and they are not competent, things like this can happen. So we have to do it where? Well, on the body or the sternum. Do you understand, class? Yes. Because that is where the heart is, and it's safer there, because if you do it here in the cipher process, you break the cipher process and you can puncture the lung. You have a choice to puncture either the lung, liver, or spleen on how to kill the patient. But you will never do that because you're smart, you're critical thinkers, and you're competent. You will always put your hand where? On the body of the sternum with the elbow straight. Do you understand? Okay. Now, how many true ribs do we have? Seven. Seven. How many false ribs? Five. Seven plus five is? So we have 12, right? Now, take a look. What is this rib made of? Is it bone or bone? Bone. Costal cartilage. Is it made of cartilage or cartilage? Cartilage. There you go. Costal cartilage, bony rib. The reason why they're called true ribs because for every bony rib there is a corresponding one. Cartilage, bone, cartilage, bone, cartilage, bone, one to seven. What happens to eight, nine, and 10? They share a common cartilage. What about 11 and 12? They're also known as false rays, but they're also known as floating rays because they float. They are not attached where? Very good. Do you, do, you, do you know how simple it is? They're floating because they're not attached to the sternum. Do you understand? Yes. Now, if you break a rib, can you puncture the lung? Yes. yes. So be very careful. Like people, when you drive on the free, how many of you drive at 100 miles per hour? Okay, continue. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you have these airbags, they're not going to guarantee that you will not have broken rib. What happens if you have broken rib? Can that broken rib puncture your lung? Yes. You're not bleeding there. It's called pneumothorax. Sudden onset for difficulty of breathing. Or what? What is SOB? Sorry, a bitch, a shortness of <laughs> shortness of breath. Exactly. Okay. Do you understand what? Okay. What else? Now, this is called the scapula, right? The scapula. Clavicle. Why is the clavicle the collar bone? Because it's in the area of the collar, shoulder blade bone, or the scapula. This is called the glenoid cavity. Is it not? Is it glenoid or Glendale? <laughs> How many of you are from Glendale, California? Okay. Nobody's from Glendale. Okay. What is the place there called? I love to eat those por por portals. portals. Yes, you Glenoid cavity. That's the socket. What is the head? The head of the humerus is the ball. Now, in the pelvis, where they mention this, a left bone, a left crest, pubic bone, ischium. The socket is the acetabulum. And that is the head of the femur, correct? Okay. Now, Appendicular skeleton also includes what? The upper lip, humerus, radius, ulna. That's why we say radius near the area of the thumb. Ulna near the little finger. So when I say check for your radial pulse, which board are you going to look for? The radius. Oh my God. I love anatomy. The radius is in the same area where your thumb is. Thumb, radius, radial pulse. What is the bone here? What is a little finger, right? In, in forensic medicine, in, in pathology, do you watch the show CSI? Yes. Crime scene investigation. Yes. Why are they so particular where the point of injury is? Because it tells you what happened, right? Example, young lady, can you come here? <laughs> Pretend that this is a knife or a something. Order, right? Okay. Pretend. Okay. 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 Hit me. Okay. 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 What will hit the knife or the whatever sharp object? The ulna, right? So, okay. One more time. Okay. One more time. I'm just. Okay. Thank you. Let's give her a big hand. I just showed to you. In most common cases. When you do a crime scene investigation, <laughs> you will exactly determine what part of the body is being hit by the sharp object, right? Mm -hmm. Often than not, what do we do? Don't kill me, don't hit me. <laughs> Unless you go like this. 
<laughs> I, I want you to eat my rages. <laughs> I want to mislead the pathologist when I die. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Most of us, I think 99% would always do this, right? Oh, no! <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Okay, but that's what I'm saying. Uh, oh, man, by the way, remember that show, Bones? Yeah. Is it still there? No, no more, right? Uh, I remember the bone because that alone can tell, determine what kind of pathology the patient, what kind of criminal uh, case they have dealing with, right? So the same thing. Okay, so now what else do we have to cover? So we talked about the uh, upper limb and then of course in the lab we're going to talk about the different compound but there are eight of them right mm -hmm. like for example here which one has the hook the hamate, hamate. which is the largest the capitate. capitate okay and then the lunate and then of course the most often fractured bone scaphoid why because it's the bone near what the radius right uh -huh. radiocarpal joint is the wrist joint right so the, the scaphoid bone is the most commonly fractured bone here like when you fall and you go like this can you can you break your radius Yes, can you also break the scaphoid bone? Yes. yes, you can, right? So what's the largest bone there? <laughs> Capitate. Capitate. What is the one with the hook? Hamate. Hamate. H for hamate, H for hook. Which one is going to be easily broken? Scaphoid. Scaphoid bone. Do you understand, class? So apparently when you're dealing with the bones of what we call carpal bone, these are the wrist bones, right? Okay. And how many metacarpal bones do we have? Five. Six? Five. <laughs> I thought I heard six. I said, you must not be human then. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. The last time I counted, there were five, right? Yeah. We always count with the, the big toe, uh, big, big, big toe, big the thumb. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five. And the phalange is the same thing. First digit, second, third, fourth, fifth. Proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. From second to the fifth. Four times three is 12, 13, 14, right? Okay. Now, the same thing with the femur. Make sure, we don't really have to know the part, but in the lab you were given a chance to know some of them, like head, neck, greater lateral trochanter, condyles, mm -hmm. medial and lateral condyles, the articulating surface. It will articulate with what bone? The tibia below, right? That form the knee joint, right? This is the knee joint, right? And of course, the fibula, which is on the side, it is not weight-bearing because it's very small, right? And of course the foot, right? So what is the heel bone? Calcaneus. Calcaneus. What is the bone on top of the calcaneus? Talus. And what is the bone in front of the calcaneus? C for calcaneus, C for cuboid. Calcaneus, C, C for cuboid. Talus, navicular. And the three bones here? Medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms. Now what corresponds to the metacarpal in the hand? This is called metatarsal. M-E-T-A-T-A-R-S-A-L. And we have the same name for the toes. We call, do we call them what? Phalanges. Very good, phalanges, right? How many do we have there? 14. 14 plus 14, total of 28 toes, right? Okay, do you understand? Yes. See? So these are tarsal bones, metatarsal bones, and the toes, right? Okay? So we have all these bones here. I think we have gone over most of these bones. So this is actually uh, another view of the cyphoid process, body and the manubrium of the sternum. Okay. Another bone that is the oscoxa, remember? Acetabulum of the pelvic bones, the pelvic girdle. And if I show this, what is this bone? How many bones were there used to be separately five? S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, they got, they got fused. And then you have the coccyx here. Two to four, three average, you also got fused to form your tailbone, right? Okay. And then we have here, the, of course, the bones of the lower limb and the bones of the upper limb, the humerus, the radius, and of course, the ulna. Right? Okay? Now, <coughs> let's talk about joints. When we're dealing with joints, can anybody tell me, or articulations, if I put the word here, articulation, and joint formation, you have three types. What are they? Synarthrosis, amphi, and die. 
arthrosis. What happens in sin arthrosis? No movement. What about amphiarthrosis? Little or some movement, right? What about diarthrosis, class? What is it? It is freely movable. Okay? That's where most of our lower and upper limb joints freely movable. Okay? Under synarthrosis, the example in the book, there were three of them. Fibrous, cartilaginous, and bone fusion, right? Under bone fusion, what's the term they use? Sin what? Ostosis, right? What about examples of fibrous type of sin arthrosis? What is the example given in the book? There were two of them. The sutures of your skull, do they move? No, no. no they don't, right? Sutures. And what about the teeth attachment to the alveolar socket? It's called go pulses. What about the example given for the cartilaginous type of sin arthrosis? What is the example given there? Yes? Hmm? Yes? It's in the book, right? What's the example given there? Under the word sin arthrosis. Huh? Between the what? Okay. The sternum and the rib, right here, right? So th these are examples of what? Sin arthrosis, right? So sternum and ribs. Now under amphiarthrosis, we also have fibrous and cartilaginous, right? Example for cartilaginous is what? The symphysis pubis, right? Remember the word symphysis pubis? Cartilaginous because it's joined by a fibrocartilate. Can this easily break? When you are in a car injury with blood trauma here, the bladder is there, you end up with blood in the urine. Because what is found behind this? The urinary bladder. So be aware of that possibility. So a patient with driving a car and ends up with a fracture here or separation, can they separate? They could, why? Because they're slightly movable, right? What about pregnant women? Do they also slightly separate when you're pregnant? Yes, why? They're large to make the baby what? Easily come out, right? Okay. So synthesis. So this is an example of syndesmosis, which is fibrotic uh, tissue. And remember the example I think in the book was about the ligaments, right? And they're around the different bones, right? It surrounds the bones. Anyway, so make sure you know this. Diarthrosis, the ones we have been talking about, right? For example, under diarthrosis, there are many types. I would say when you see the word ball and socket joints, what does it mean? It involves what? Shoulder and the hip. See, I love this movement here. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external rotation, internal rotation, and circumduction. Same thing with the hip. Flexion, forward, extension, abduction to the side, adduction, external rotation, internal rotation, right? When you dance, remember? And then of course, circumduction. Okay. What about a hinge joint? The elbow. elbow, right? Your elbow, right? The elbow. Very example, common example. Same thing with your uh, the knee, okay? But it's a modified hinge joint. Hinge like the hinge of the door. Open and close, right? What about pivot? P-I-V-O-T. C1, C2. C1 and C2. C1 is the atlas, remember? The first C1 is the first cervical vertebrae. <coughs> and what is C2? Axis. The axis, which contains the dense. So if this is C1, which is just a ring, C1, which is cer cervical one, spine, which is called the atlas. Why was it called the atlas? Because remember the guy, the Greek god, <laughs> naked, can you imagine me naked and yeah. <laughs> holding what? <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> holding what? The globe. The, the head represents the globe and the C1 is the big, so C1. What about C2? Axis. So atlato axial joint can allow, allow you to do this, right? Not tonight, honey, I've got the headache, okay? I cannot wash the dishes. Oh, you're thinking of something else again, okay? Okay, what about if I go like this? Yes, tonight is the night that I will wash the dishes. Okay, okay. 
Where does it occur? Where? Does it occur? where? Between occipital bone and C1. Yes, dear. I'll be faithful forever. Okay? You understand? What about this one? No? So, no means no. No means no, right? This one means yes. Okay? Now, with regards to, uh, what about, there was a special joint here. The first carpal, metacarpal joint. Saddle joint, remember the thumb? And the, the carpal means the trapecium here, and then the metacarpal here. Saddle joint, which is quite unique, right? Another one is called gliding, right? Your uh, uh, ternoclavicular, acromioclavicular joint, they glide. Which still, there's still some movement, but it's not as common as the elbow and the wrist of the other joints, right? Okay, so these joints, if they are, there are a lot of pathology which we will learn later on in pathophysiology. What is an inflammation of the joint called arthritis, right? Our joint has what? The common, the arthrogen joints are what we call synovial joints because why? They're lined with synovial membrane that secretes what? Synovial, synovial fluid for what purpose? Lubrication. It's basically your KY jelly in the joint to reduce the friction so that there will be no pain whenever we move the joints, right? So every time we do this, we should thank the synovial membrane. Thank you, synovial membrane. You made my day. Because why? It reduces the friction within the joint. It's as you move the joint, at the same time, it causes no pain, right? But when there is arthritis, there will be excessive amount of fluid and we have to drain that with a needle and a syringe, right? And you will learn that later on in core nursing. Who will perform the procedure? The surgeon, the doctor. Who will assist the doctor? You. It should be done in a sterile manner with all sterile technique procedures, okay? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Now, other arthritis, have you heard of gouty arthritis? Yes. Can uric acid crystals deposit in your joints? Yes. Yes. Especially the big toe? Yes. yes. Can it be very painful? It could be very painful. Aggravated by drinking alcohol. How many of you drink alcohol here? Okay, continue drinking. And if you develop gouty arthritis, no, I'm just joking. Not everybody develops gouty arthritis. It could be a predisposing factor or genetic uh, predisposition, but not everybody that drinks alcohol will develop what? Gouty arthritis, right? The only, the only problem if you drink too much is their liver, right? So drink in moderation. I drink a lot of Coke cane, <laughs> Coke with sugar cane. Where is my Coke? They're over there, okay? Not Pepsi Cola, but Coke, okay? Alcohol, I don't like alcohol. I don't like the taste, but uh, I don't mind sometimes, occasionally. Now, okay, so now it's, um, I'm going to give you a short break of uh, around 10 minutes, and then 10 minutes, or oh, 15 minutes is fine. If you come back, I will give the quiz, okay? Okay.